Okay. Ben, um, it's lovely to have you here. Uh, I would love to introduce you. Why don't you introduce yourselves to the people who watch my channel? Hey, thanks for having me, Andy. Uh, my name is Ben Mackinnon. I'm a filmmaker uh, via a career spent drumming, uh, primarily um, in jazz. But um, as you know, Andy, the uh, any modern drummer is going to find themselves playing a lot of different styles. So um, I spent pretty much close to 40 years playing drums, touring Broadway shows, um, jazz bands, rock bands, blues bands, uh, the whole thing. That segued into... Um, uh, working as a music producer, composing, writing, and arranging, and um, uh, and of course the requisite teaching that goes along with the career in music, and that led its way into uh, making music videos, and then uh, released my first full uh, length feature uh, film uh, last Christmas Day, Jazz Town. That was my first uh, feature length documentary. I had done a number of short films um, leading up to that, and um, that's basically it. It, in a, a nutshell, Andy. That, that's a hell of a career. So, uh, you know, and uh, brilliant that you're uh, still doing it. I always say this to everybody, you know, if that's that's the success, isn't it? If you, if you can keep doing it, then that's great. Um, as, uh, well, as Yeah, I'm not sure it's the wisest path I've chosen, <laughs> but <laughs> it's, uh, it, you know, it, it, you follow your passion and that's where it takes you. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I love, I, I love like you, music and I just love it. So um, hold on to that tiger's tail and let it let it swing you where it may. And of course, then then you made the decision of being a jazz musician, <laughs> which is like. The... I'm not sure how much of a decision that was. You know what I mean? It, it pulled me there. But uh, it's funny you say that when I was in high school, uh, my buddies, of course, my the other drummer, my my friends who are drummers, we were all in the marching band together and the school bands, and they were all rock and rollers. And um, and they heard me play, and they said, "Ben, man, you're a rock and roller. You should go into rock and roll, man." <laughs> <laughs> they they tried they tried to warn me, so they would drag me down to the uh, like the Led Zeppelin movies and the Pink Floyd movies and, and kind of indoctrinate me into into the world of rock. We, we'd sneak our little bottles of beer into the music theater and or into the uh, movie theaters. And, and then I would drag them down. I would drag them over to my father's uh, basement and, and play Ornette Coleman records and John Coltrane. And and how did that go down? And of course, you'd appreciate, <laughs> Andy, well, well, you'd appreciate this, Andy. They were, uh, of course, we're, you and I, I believe are pretty much the same age. And back in the eighties with much fewer uh, choices of symbols, we would all we would get into arguments over Pisces versus Zildjian, and of course, all the rock and rollers were Pisces guys, and all the jazzers were Zildjian guys discovering Istanbul, and yeah. um, so we had funny, funny arguments over that kind of thing. But oh, it's, a, it's the divide between rock and jazz. I'm sure we get there. So, um, you know, I posted up a video of about a month ago and i expected this to be a very unpopular video it was a bit philosophical it wasn't the normal thing i did and it seems to have um considering it's about jazz it seems to have had a traveled a long way right um i've had a lot of pushback from people uh, and i've had a lot of people agreeing with it and so it's obviously um a contentious and interesting area of discussion and the question i asked is why do modern jazz musicians all sound the same and that sort of points to whether jazz is still a creative force whether jazz is alive and you messaged me straight off um saying you agreed with some of it um but you felt that i'd missed a lot of nuances and you sent me a link to your film and i watched your film and i went yeah i did meet a i did miss a whole bunch of nuances without doubt uh in in a, in a way it was even worse than i thought when i watched your documentary you know to see um that something i'd never thought was the effect of covid on jazz you know that that's a thing that's happened hasn't it so um it, tell you know give me a bit of pushback what what did you think about that video and what do you think i didn't get right well actually andy i i i i loved a lot of what yeah. uh, you said and where you're coming from i um 
And I was uh, quite honestly impressed that it was coming from a quote unquote frog rock drummer guy. Um, Cause you obviously know uh, your jazz history and, and you've spent a lot of time um, um, uh, appreciating learning it. Uh, you know, your observations about, I, I really liked a lot of what you said. It's going back to your initial statement though. It is interesting to me. Be how much of a hot topic jazz has become um, almost like a trigger for many yeah. people where it never was that when, when we were teens, uh, it was either something you liked or didn't like, yeah, big deal, you know? Um, but I think a big part of that's coming from the academic, uh, um, uh, the academic, I guess, nurturing and teaching of jazz. There's, there's a, it's a two, it's a two sided sword from what I see, but I, I see a lot of uh, people coming out of master's programs at very uh, um, high esteemed music universities who have quite an attitude about jazz. I mean, the, the things that are being taught and perpetuated in the academy some of it's great obviously the 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 technique and the and the well basically the technique and the theory that's being um uh, that's being taught is, is is sending these kids off the charts in terms of the 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 stuff they're able to play these days and the things they're writing and um but there is a distinct attitude there's a lot of attitude and if we have time to get into it i think there's some miss if it's not misinformation it's it's miss uh, characterized uh, things that are either overlooked or um, or blackwashed might be a term that we address. Yeah. There, we were very familiar with whitewashing of history, but if, if, when we start to examine the Native American Indian and their role in the development of jazz, I'm getting ahead of myself. Yeah, yeah. But I liked going back into your video. I liked your observation about um, the change from the. Um, the complex chordal um, harmonic activity of the beboppers, let's say, that led up into what you, what you quite correctly kind of nailed is 1959, um, that year up until, I can't remember now if you said 64 or if you went up to 69 yeah. as well, but, uh, and there was a shift that the jazzers, a lot of jazzers made coming back into a modal or, a, a, you know, a form of jazz that um, kind of backed off that complex uh, bebop um dense chordal yeah. movement um I, and you named a lot of great players and 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 influential albums um i think you mentioned charlie mingus and dave brubeck and um and and that progression into fusion um uh it's interesting i you know your video is pretty deep man you cover a lot of stuff P remind me where i jumped in at what i took issue with what with what you said you, all, all you what said is you, you said you'd love to have a discussion because you feel that the um, the situation is more nuanced, which of course it was because it was a twenty minute video and I I just opened up the, uh, the, the 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 discussion. When I watched your film, one of the things that struck me was you'd interviewed working jazz musicians for a start, not college graduates, but people who are working, and 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 they all felt that the um, jazz world that they were in now it seemed to be diminishing for all sorts of different reasons what one of the things that's really apparent in that video is that a lot of the people that you interviewed then subsequently died didn't they so there's there's a there, there's a, there's a generation going and, it, and we're having that in rock music as well you know we look at the rolling stones and tina turner and jeff beck and suddenly that generation's going which sort of pushes things into sort of the past into myth almost uh, and that's something I got from your film. Uh, also, the that's idea of the, the idea of um, I mean, when I when I was I was an adult. I can remember. Me and my mates would go up to Birmingham, which is just half an hour up the road, and we would go and see Red Rodney and he would be at a jazz club and he would be playing. And that guy had played with Charlie Parker. I can remember going to like a bar. Uh, and Tal Farlow is in there playing. And then he was hanging out at the bar. And we didn't think that much about it. These guys were just there. Now, if you say Red Rodney or Tal Farlow, that this is their legends. Jazz has become legendified. It's 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 and I think that whole Winter Marsalis Stanley Crouch thing that happened in the 80s is is turned jazz from being not just 
a, like a almost of the street, but transgressive. Um, and so I think there's a sort of there, there's always been an elitism there, but the elitism was cool in the old days. Lester Young was cool, you know. Uh, Charlie Parker was cool. They were transgressive. They were seeing things in different ways. And I feel that that's almost been picked up and made into sort of like a museum piece. And then when you watch your film, you can see that the, the real musicians, they're just trying to make a living. You know, they just want to get it. They just they need some venues to play in. They need, you know, an audience to listen. The audience has changed and all those types of things. And I went, yeah, this is this is bigger than I thought. And uh, the sort of jazz industry, which is um, um, is now on YouTube and and instagram you know this is the way things are happening it's sort of keeping it alive but it's keeping it alive in a certain way um your your documentary opened more questions you know asked more questions for me you know which is why i wanted to talk to you you know I, I want you to take your take as being a jazz musician that's moved towards making documentaries and and how you see the state of jazz right now you know maybe some of the stuff i've missed well, I'm, I'm not sure that you actually missed anything. Um, I think it's interesting. Well, I'll, I'll answer your question and go. I actually read one of your blogs, some writing you did, yeah. oddly enough, in which you said you prefaced the writing saying, well, no one's probably going to find this. They're finding <laughs> me on YouTube now. But I read your blog and, yeah. and I and, and there's there's two there's two things that you mentioned in your blog that are very, very commonly mentioned whenever people talk about jazz. They're, and to me, they're almost, uh, they've become oversimplifications of an extremely complex um, and, and um, genesis to this music. And, and, I, and I think tying into what you said about the, the, the mythologization, the, the mythology that's been created around some of these um, wonderful musicians who are at the end of the day very human as you said has to do with with well there's it's there's a there's a need for people on the one hand to make what they're doing very special and uh, sometimes to imbue it with more um more of that fantasy and myth as you say um because it's exciting to do it and it, it raises the value of it. it it sort of calls people calls people attention to what you're doing and i mean so there's there, those two, two things you mentioned in your blog is that is 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 one and maybe I should come back to these because they're very, very polarizing. They're very hot topics today. But let me just go back and and preface this by saying the 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 masters that I grew up with that that I have paid homage to into my first film, Jazz Town. Uh, these were musicians who played with Charlie Parker and Billie Holiday and Duke Ellington and Count Basie and um, and then even later on Ross on Roland Kirk, uh, Sonny Rollins, Max Roach. These these guys and women uh, were my mentors, and one thing that they never did, none of them ever spoke to claims of who invented jazz or where it was invented. Um, very little of what transpired was was had anything to do with history. It was playing the music the right way, mm. uh, playing the music the way they needed. If as a drummer, as a sideman, I had to learn how to support them in a way that um, they could do their thing. Um, and and so the lessons were very just in the now musical. It was an attitude. It was how you play. It was how you interpreted the music. Is a lot of it was what you don't do as a drummer, you know, how to play supportively, how to stay out of the way, how to how to how to understand the lyric of a song, and and use that as the um, the basis of if you're playing standards, how to know what the song is trying to say, what the story of the song is, rather than what my agenda as a guy who spends all day practicing drums, coming to the bandstand with with a goal to show off my fancy chops. I had to learn from them to put the the story of the song first. The point of all that, this was also, as you know, pre-internet. None of these musicians were doing anything on a daily basis to, to self-promote themselves. They weren't video. They weren't cell phoning their rehearsals or their performances on stage. So, I spent a good thirty years as a as a first as a student, 
and then, you know, as a mentee, and then and then I was starting to play with these people on stage. Thirty years went by before I knew eighty percent of what they had done in their past. I didn't know these guys had recorded with Ross on Roland Kirk. <laughs> um, Freddie Rodriguez Sr. is a sax player in jazz town. He recorded with Ross on. He he was living in L.A. and and playing in uh, Gerald Wilson's big band. I, these guys didn't brag about it. They didn't post about it. They weren't written about. So. So, boom, that was all off the table. It was just, this was a guy who had the gig, who I knew had some serious jobs and had a past. I just didn't know what it was. So I wasn't there to worship a star. I was there to learn the music. And they they were there. To them, the most important thing was that I learned to understand and respect the music, how to play it, um, how to live it. And, um, and so it's interesting today to hear all these people who – and this is important because before we get into this deep controversial stuff, I feel it's important to remind ourselves of what we have in common. And that is the love of music. So no matter how deep and, and contentious we get at the end of the day, if we're talking about jazz music, we love it. It doesn't matter if you're a Democrat or a Republican, or if you like dogs and I like cats or, you know, the, the point is, is can we sit down together and make music and do we enjoy that? And if we do, that's probably enough. That's that's what the music is about. It was never meant to be. A, I don't think the history of jazz has anything to do with being divisive, with being combative, with fighting over who invented it, when it was invented, what what swings. Is it a triplet or is it a straight eighth note? All this stuff. None of these guys cared about that. They cared about sitting down and making music. And if it felt great, great, come back and let's do it again. <laughs> you know, or if it was really great, come back and join my band. Now let's make a record. It was didn't matter about the color of your skin, where you came from. It just it mattered if you could sit down and play and listen and 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 believe it and be honest and true. So why do so many people get pissed off today when you talk about Jazz is a black music. Jazz comes from African Americans. Jazz is democratic. Jazz is jazz is about democracy. Well, I I I take issue with those things. Those those oversimplify things and they and they they create patterns of non-thinking. So when you go back to the start of jazz, you have to ask, well, what is jazz? Are you talking about music? Well, are you talking about uh, the music that was labeled jazz after 1917? Because prior to 1917, 1916, the word jazz wasn't used to label any music. So this is where it gets complicated because if the first jazz record was made by a bunch of white dudes, Caucasians, the original Dixieland jazz band, you can't claim that jazz was started by black people in the year 1917. You have to go you have to go behind. You have to go earlier than 1917. What was happening? Who are black people? Are black people just African descendants who arrived in America via the slave trade? Or are black people, is, is that a term you use to encompass all of the non-Caucasian people living in America uh, through the 1800s to the turn of the century, when we start to identify blues morphing into ragtime, morphing into what was later called jazz music. It's complex because if you look at New Orleans in the late 1800s, you have Native American Indians living alongside the Creole people. The Creole people come from Haiti. They come from all over the Caribbean. They're a mixture of African and Europeans. And those Creole people arrived in America in the 1700s, late 1700s. Um, some of them were slave owners. Some of them were already a, a mix of French and English and other European. These are the people that commingled with the slave population present in America. The slave population had been taken, many of the escaped slaves were taken in by Native Americans. From the time slaves landed here in America, Native Americans, Indians, were taking them in and um, absorbing them into their own culture. This great mixture was happening. So by the time you have Congo Square in New Orleans, 
it's it's a vibrant mixture of of a blended um African diaspora with the European ancestry mixed in there with the Native American Indian roots already there. And the Native American Indians have their drum, they have their 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 slurs and their growls and their scoops, the same things we identify. So so I take issue with people who say jazz was invented by blacks because one, they're not defining what jazz is and they're not defining what black is. And there's a lot of history that takes Native American Indians and Creoles and puts them under the black umbrella. And then that becomes sort of a, a, um, um, a misappropriation. It's, it's, it's a slight, it's a huge disrespect to the cultures that are Native American Indian and Creole, for example, because the Creole people made it very clear they were not black. They did not call themselves black. They were coming from a very different culture and they had a very different um, set of, of rights really and cultural backgrounds than, than the Africans who come from the slave uh, plantation. It's deep, okay? Then people say, well, like you wrote in your blog, jazz is democratic. I don't think jazz is democratic at all. <laughs> If you're defining democracy, if you're finding democratic as being the democracy as, as that has been attempted to be practiced here in America. Um, I've worked in jazz bands for 40 years and there's a band leader who tells you what you're gonna play and who gets to solo. So, so, you know, jazz was used by the US government starting in the 1950s with the State Department sending Duke Ellington and Louis Armstrong around the world to play this great music. And to, to show the world, look how great democracy is. Look what we do when, as you know, Andy, the you know Louis Armstrong and Duke Ellington would come back to America and, and be treated as second class citizens or subject to racism. So um, it's it's those two things really bug me when I hear those because then they get repeated on a PhD level and everyone's just saying jazz is democratic, jazz is black, and then and then that disenfranchises a whole lot of people and it's 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 historically not accurate so there's that yeah so i that's that's really interesting that is um and it's it's interesting as you're saying about the democratic idea of, of of jazz representing that i've got that from stanley crouch who a lot of the time i really disagree with he was the one who put forth that idea and i do think it's more nuanced i think the reason why i stress that is because and this is one of the things that's come out with this video. Someone's done a reaction. Two jazz musicians have done a reaction to my video, and they hated it. They really hated it. And they keep saying, "I love." Oh, by, by the way, I love it, and thank you, Andy, for putting that out there because these conversations have to be had. They, 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 it's it, because they're fun. Because they're fun. Yeah. This is the thing. They're fun because this is music, and we can have conversations about this without hurting everybody. That's one of the things I love about music. But anyway, they, they, they. There's a common argument against me, which was sort of, um, it's always been like this. If you go back to the 1950s, people were copying. If you go back to the 1950s, they were good, great musicians. And now we don't know who the great musicians are and stuff like this. And I and I thought, well, if, if this is the case, I'll just go back 20 years. So I go into Google. I put 2003 greatest jazz albums. And I'm reading a, a bunch of names. Wayne Shorter. Well, oh, yeah, well, Wayne Shorter's a legend from the 60s. There's some people who'd made great albums and they're really great players, but I didn't see a Thelonious Monk in that list. And we've gone back 20 years, you know, and if you go back to Thelonious Monk's time and then go back 20 years again, it's completely different. You know, there's greats and greats. And so um, I don't accept this thing that culture just stays the same. Everybody stays the same, that it's just the same old thing going round and round. And jazz is just trottling along like it did 70 years ago. I don't accept that. And part of the reason is because I think culture's changed. And I think we are looking back at jazz history through a certain lens, right? And so I champion the, the democratic part of it, of, of saying what I'm really trying to get across is those musicians weren't thinking like that back then. It's, it's, it is very close to the, 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 the sentiment you're saying, you know. Um, I think that um, jazz musicians didn't, if you go back to Louis Armstrong, who was a fan of Big Spiderbeck, he um, and played with Big Spiderbeck. He, I mean, he couldn't play with him because of all the awful racism. But those guys got together and jammed because they loved each other's playing. And Bix was into, in, you know, influenced by Louis. Louis was influenced by Bix. All this stuff's going on. I don't think they were seeing like that because there is an aspect of jazz 
where you can bring yourself to it and it erases these ideas of identity i think that's really what i have the problem with is this idea of identity and modern uh, modern ideas of identity being placed on these people in historically that's exactly right yeah. well that's a great point andy you're right identity politics has become a huge part of it arguably ever since jazz music has been commercialized and and the term yeah. jazz i think i think a lot of people can agree it was a commercial term oddly enough it came from baseball I th the word was first in print in description of a curveball that a baseball player was going to use in an upcoming game however the identity poli politics behind it is fascinating using lenses to view history in retrospect is a fascinating element and i think you're right even one of louis armstrong's contemporaries sydney bechet uh is is quoted talking about the importance of this music breathing beyond each generation, that it must grow, that if you try, Sidney Bechet, uh, you know, from the beginning was warning. Yeah. If you try, he, Sidney Bechet took issue, he, he was concerned with the Dixielanders writing down the arrangements in an attempt to sort of codify or preserve what they felt was great. And that's fine to do that. But Sidney was saying, be careful, because if you try to, uh, encode something and, and ossify it, you're going to, you're going to kill it or at least keep it from growing. So yeah, there's, there's a fantastic dem there's democratic qualities for sure. And, and, and there's, and it goes back again, the spirit of jazz music is not one of division. That's, that's why Louis Armstrong played with white guys, you know, uh, the trombonist and, 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 and everyone from the beginning, yeah. they didn't care if you could play, you could play. Yeah. Um, it's it's the other people who try to make who try to uh, control aspects of the narrative, and that's where we have to be careful because when the narrative is written um, and repeated simply by historians uh, or or fans of the mu of the music critics, people write books and it comes across as fact, but they're really um, drawing conclusions based on their own opinions with with uh, a sprinkling of fact. It's it's very interesting what happens when when you use that reverse lens, but but it does get your question about where where is jazz going and who's making great jazz and what is jazz. Um, I oftentimes the great jazz musicians themselves are are not the ones qualified to answer that. Um, uh, many of them get stuck liking their own. There are a few wise ones who always say, you know, I'm not sure that I know what's going on with so and so, but I think they got it. They got it. They're saying something. And we in the present can't identify it or won't identify it as jazz. But to me, it is jazz. I hear a lot of these young guys, um, you know, to oversimplify the the blending of, of hip hop rhythms. Basically, what a lot of jazzers did in the 70s, what you talked about, the fusion. It's just a fusion again. Every change is a fusion. The, uh, what the Dixielanders, when the beboppers came along and how the Dixielanders couldn't stand it, maybe didn't even... Uh, well, certainly didn't like it, maybe didn't understand it. That was a fusion going on. And then bringing in Cuban rhythms, Dizzy Gillespie, that's a new fusion. Well, this whole using turntables, sampling, hip hop beats, um, you know, um, to me, that's jazz. And and because a lot of those musicians, they've got the spirit. They, they've got the feeling. They've either listened to enough jazz, they respect it enough, they're sampling it. They get it and they're moving forward. They're young and they're not interested in doing uh, museum music. And, and you know, Miles Davis famously said that in his autobiography as well. You know, I, he said he felt sorry for those motherfuckers who are keeping trying to play the music we played in the 60s, you know. So, so jazz, is, uh, jazz is very much alive. The film I made, the short film, Who Killed Jazz, really speaks, really was my attempt to find out from older musicians why we're still playing for 50 year old frozen wages why do why do musicians go out uh and play in the clubs for 50 year old wages you know and we know club owners every single cost to run their business has gone up from the electricity to the insurance to the price of beer beer think of your favorite brand named beer that recipe hasn't changed in 50 years, but the price has, it's gone up. So everything from the wages of their bar staff to the napkins and the straws and, and, the, and the air conditioning, everything, they're paying more for everything, but they're not paying more to the musicians. 
So as a result, you get a lot of musicians who don't go out anymore or, or who become so bitter and cynical, they stop, they stop breathing life into their music. And, and to me, that's a big danger as well. So who killed jazz is that short film explores a confluence of, you know, changing attitudes. Sometimes it's the fault of the musician. Are the musicians playing music that the audience want to hear? If you're playing um, all the things you are again, you know, if you're playing 60, 70, 80 year old music the same way, you know, do you, why, how do you expect 20 year olds to go out and dig it? <laughs> yeah. It, so that, so um, I think this, the way I put it all is this, that um, as soon as you say jazz is dead, who killed jazz? Jazz musicians all sound the same. It's all been Berkeley-fied. I heard that term. I thought it was great. It's all been Berkeley-fied. It's just, it's just rich kids. They're the only ones who could afford to go to jazz college. It's, it's not the street. All these things. As soon as you start saying that, there's a big pushback. There's a massive pushback, and that's what I've got. And 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 there's without a doubt. And there's a lot of agreement, right? If it's well, not the thing the, is, Andy. Let me just jump yeah. in. The, the kicker to that is, how do you define jazz? And this, that's what throws so many people, the, that, the Berkeleyfication. I mean, when we're talking about trying to play the fake book or the real book tunes, that's what I think most people think jazz is, you know, these this collection of standards. A lot of people think jazz started it somewhere in 1945 with Dizzy and Thelonious Monk and that, it, it, you know, and that, like you said in your video, it if it doesn't, if it if it goes up to 1959, it better stay in that. So a lot of people, when they talk about jazz, they're not talking about what Veronica Swift, for, for example, is doing now with her tran trans genre music. You know, she's blending Freddie Mercury. She's taking Queen, Queen songs and blend, blending them in with like Mel Torme or uh, um, Sarah Vaughan. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and, I, 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 the way I see it is this. Um, new art forms emerge. They're very visceral at the start. They're obviously ob often very entertaining. The public catch on. Uh, art forms don't catch on unless they're popularist at the start. And then the the new things that have um, that are in there, they sort of coalesce and it starts to become sublime as as these things gain power. And that's great. That process is really great. And then you get this big flourishing of great art. Um, I can't see how any art form can exist unless it's popular at the time or it's discovered historically and that's a different thing because that's a one-off it can't develop you see so um then it becomes codified once it becomes codified the rules start to come in the more the rules start to come in that form actually is a, it's a great form it's a genre now and you can play it and you can play it well and people can enjoy it you know you can go and watch beethoven and you can enjoy it but if you take beethoven now and change it the, the that or that classical audience will go well that's not beethoven anymore you're doing something else with it if that's the case um is it there an argument for jazz looking at its history and looking at primarily all the music forms that came afterwards and trying to own some of that stuff rather than seeing it as a pollutant coming back in to the form which is what always seems to happen and that emerged with fusion you know, as when Fusion came in, suddenly, the first time ever, you had the critics kicking back against it, you know, and they didn't like, oh, they're selling out. I put on Bitches Brew, Tony Williams' Lifetime, I listened to the Mavish Nocturne. I can't hear the sellout. It sounds heavy, but it was popular and heavy. And yet that got disowned. And then a few years later, you get that kickback with the sort of Winter Monsalis period. If that's the case... We do need to have this conversation because I think jazz musicians can rescue it if they if we can get this on the table, if you could discuss it and get it on the table and actually open our arms and be more em embracing to musicians that are coming up. But I work with young people and they find jazz off putting because there's already somebody saying you didn't play through the changes. You know, you played that dominant chord and you're supposed to play a flat seven there and you played that note. You can play that when you know it well, but you need to do this and you need to do that. And you did in 1940. In 19, you did need to don't know that. You know, there's kids coming up playing metal. I can't do that on the drums. You know, it's in, it's incredible stuff. Incredible stuff. But the jazz musicians go, oh, yeah, but that's something else. And that's that's different. 
I'm really arguing for jazz is opening up its arms so it just doesn't die out because the audience out there doesn't want to know anymore. That's the bottom line. You know, they don't want to hear someone playing all the things you are because they don't get it. They don't know those tunes. They're not they're not part of their culture. They don't understand the the importance of jazz doing at the time was creating new music forms, but they're not anymore. They're just, you know, so that's that's my position on it, basically. Yeah, and I think I think this ties into what you were saying on your uh, YouTube video that I that I took issue with is that is that I think that's completely correct within the academically trained jazz musicians and and basically their friends and parents that they're playing for, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, because they are the ones that understand it and and they've been it, it, it they've been the ones that have been taught to become overprotective, uh, aggressive, and fearful of change. Really, they're. And 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 maybe that's okay if we see them as people who are scribes protecting the ancient ways. You know, um, you know, they're trying to they're trying fiercely to 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 keep jazz in this precious box. And all the great jazz masters that we that we collectively recognize typically f spent their lives staying out of that box. Totally. You know? Totally right, and, and and they and like you said, Miles caught slack from the critics, but he stayed with it, and and he got he kept people dancing, he kept his music relevant, he kept his music, his music had a social component that made it relevant, um, not in not necessarily in any intellectual way, but in a way that people wanted to come out and hear it, and they could feel it, and they could feel this vibrancy of 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 boundaries being torn down of new territory being explored and that to me is the spirit of the one of the great spirits of jazz that the academic academization of it is has actually crushed <laughs> or, yeah. or 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 you know uh, uh buried so uh, i'll tell you where i first sort of came to these ideas is many years ago I did a drum clinic, a bunch of young people. And a kid said, he said, can you show me something that get, will get me into playing jazz? And I said, I said, do you know any singles? He went, yeah. I said, do you know doubles? I said, you play a single, two singles, two doubles, paradiddle diddle. And I said, and you start on the beat. So you go one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Play that on the ride cymbal and you get all this left hand stuff. And then I said, and then just do this with your feet. And I was trying to get what I was trying to get, communicate with it was the way for them to get into getting a cool jazz thing going. I said, and then I just bring it in and bring it out. It's a bit of a fake sort of left hand thing, and uh, and I and I filmed it and put it on the uh, on the internet. And uh, a, a quite well known British jazz drummer who I didn't know sent me a message. He didn't say hi, Andy. The message just came through and it was said this. It went jazz question mark really question mark. And I thought, all I'm trying to do is get these kids into this music, get find them a way in. And I lost my temper. So I had a blog back there and I went on and I put a thing up saying the way jazz is at the moment is that all these kids that are interested in jazz that play rock or metal or hip hop, they're trying to find a way in. Right? They're trying to find a way in. And um, if they're allowed to come in without having all these restrictions put on them, they might bring something new to the table. They might not be able to play the changes, but they might be able to do something else. And at the bottom, I said, so I said, kids, if somebody comes along with a Charlie Mingus album under their arm and starts telling you what the, what to do, tell them to stick it up their ass. That's what I put on the blog. Right. And uh, it just exploded all over the net. And Peter Erskine came you know, he and I love Peter Erskine. And when I watch him in interview, he seems like a lovely guy. But he was going, you shouldn't even say that. You shouldn't even say Charlie Mingus with that statement. He's, 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 his name should not be mentioned in that way. And I was thinking, I, I didn't want to do anything to Charlie Mingus. Just his, just his record. Yeah, well, you shouldn't do that. You, you, that these albums are like sacred. And, and, I, and I just thought they don't get because they don't work with young people and they don't understand the psychology if we can let these guys in, right? And for me, knowing about jazz history, I thought the bebop thing was amazing. And then those musicians moved on and they tried to get the music so it was more inclusive. 
you you could never have mixed bebop jazz with rock and pop music. It had to go for that free and modal thing to be able to for it to work. And those musicians had to work out another way of express themselves within that. So there's this great big history where jazz has has tried to do that. And, and Miles didn't care about the critics when he went down the fusion route. He wasn't selling out, but he was trying to make jazz that would appeal to people, just normal people on the street, you know, especially black young black people that's who we wanted to reach and i that's the problem i have it's uh, this isn't coming from a bad place with me i'm not trying to push buttons to get the jazz community all worked up you know uh, not at all but that's my problem well yes it's it's, it's, a, it's a legitimate problem andy and i you know i come from kind of a what I, what i'm going to say is pushing buttons is fine yeah know? yeah Be, because because the story you told began with you compassionately as as great teachers do addressing a question from a student boom and you did it and you did it and and you did it in the way that you felt was right in the moment and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that what the reaction from these people shows you how insecure and 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 obscenely guarded uh, these and closed-minded these jazz musicians are I, by the way peter erskine was tremendously influential on me when he came out with that Steps Ahead record. Um, yeah. Remember, I mean, Peter Peter's drumming, he's one of those seminal figures that bridged, that took the jazz. You know, he was a drummer with, uh, was it Stan Kenton or Woody Herman? He came out of there, out of, yeah. I believe it was Stan Kenton's band. I think it was one of the Kenton Stan, jazz camps, yeah. Yeah, He well, he was playing with Stan Kenton's band. He was his drummer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and so Peter's a badass. And, and what he did with Weather Report, and then steps ahead was was game changing. And um, but the problem is a lot of people, and this is true of 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 all human beings as we we self identify with the profession. And jazz drumming, for example, takes thousands upon thousands of hours to get to a place where you feel confident enough to you to where you're not actually beating yourself up about how bad you suck. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. So, but at that point, what happens is, is, is you cling to it too much as your own identity. It becomes too sacred and too precious. And, you know, like you say, shove a record up your arse, man. I mean, you know, so what? It's, a, it's a, well, don't, it would probably hurt, but, but, but that's exactly what all these jazzers do. When you're a teenage playing music and changing the form into bebop, that's what you're doing to the old fogies. You know, and um, I mean, that's the spirit of the music. And so, but going back to your lesson, there's no right way to, to, to teach in one lesson what jazz is. I mean, so you, and all these people are going to have issues with that. The point is, is what you said. Offer a student an in, open yeah. some doors. And then it's like, why would you put a set of rules up on a sandbox before letting children go into play? You don't tell them what they can't do. Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. Yeah, and now, no, exactly go play that. <laughs> well, it's like so, I, I, and I, and I think the the way the education works is I'll have drummers come and they'll say, "I want to learn some jazz. Can you show us some jazz?" And I'll go, "Okay." So first thing is this. <laughs> I go, "I want you to do this. One, two, three, four, over, two. Can you feel that? <laughs> yeah." And I get them to do that on the right. So they, well, what about all the tingling thing? I don't need, you don't need to do that. That's the feel. It's as simple as that. It's, I, I like to bring things down to simplicity and people to try and take that in, inhabit it, right? Jazz invented swing, it invented groove. It's this part of the thing. And I, I, I always think if I can get well, one of... okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. It did not. Swing and groove has been eternal. I don't I mean, think, that's I, the... I, I, I don't think that's the case. Where, where, where it's, well... As soon as I say it, yeah, I could hear it in Indian music, in the tabla. I could hear it in African music. Yeah, yeah, y yes. I've um, heard it. I, I've heard it in nature. I, I hear crickets, a field of crickets. Chakadar, chakadar, yeah. chakadar. I mean, I like you, Ben, because you you rightly pick me up when I'm because I can be very. Oh, this is the whole thing, right? Let me let well, me preface well, that. There's, well, a, there's a particular way of swing that yes. emerged in jazz. That yes, that um. <laughs> Uh, the what the thing that was important is it emerged at a time when recording 
and so it you did. could record you could record it you know it's your your app that's, that's what I, that's what i mean that was that's the innovation it's a, it's more nuanced I, it was <laughs> it was undoubtedly the first recorded swing i'm, I'm yeah. sure that yeah. probably, probably yeah you know um yeah, yeah. it's it's a fact it's 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 brought it up to a very deep level um but um, but those raise fascinating questions. You've you've touched upon a number of great things, and I've got to go back to to the academic angle you mentioned because because that because it's because you're it sounds like you're addressing a lot of what comes out of directly from the academia and then trickles down all the friends of these musicians who come out of these master's programs, whether it's uh, the New School or Juilliard or uh, North Texas. I mean, there's there's a a plethora of heavy, intense, high-level music education here, at least in the U.S. I'm sure England has its versions, but what happens is those people come out armed with all of this jazz theory and fact, quote-unquote, and yeah. attitude. And because they have master's degrees and because they play their asses off, everyone around them goes, oh, well, whatever they say must be true about it. And they start to adopt this attitude, which is, you said, it's this ridiculous, um, aggressive, precious, you know, it's, it really comes from a lot of insecurities. And so how can you teach jazz? How can you grade jazz at university level? How can you tell someone they're not playing with enough soul or that their solo wasn't true, wasn't true to what they were, the storytelling there? You can't. So you make up all these rules, what you said earlier, the flat fives, the sevens, the changes, the chords. This is the correct way to play this two, five, one. That's the only way these schools can justify having advanced degrees and, and PhD programs is to have some codified rules that are either right, you pass, or wrong, you fail. It, and so that really screws over the, the whole feeling part of jazz. What it does is it ensures that this that this intense tech the the uh, the technique side of jazz and the drummers have this problem too you know i mean you can you can teach some pretty technical stuff that at the end of the day would totally screw over a count basie record which is just chord notes yeah. uh, you know some of those frank sinatra records and with the count basie band i mean they the whole band was swinging it, it gets deep but um so so it's important when people start getting uppity about jazz, it's first to ask them to define, to identify what what kind of music are you referring to? Because jazz is, a, is at least 130 years old now. It's been played with straight eighth notes. It's been played with triplets. It's been played with rhythm in between. It's been played in a blues idiom with one chord change. It's been played with 20 chord changes. You know, what is it? Well, Okay, so Andy, before we get too far, check out, here's two people that I think are, are doing great things that come from a jazz background. Uh, Melanie Charles. Melanie Charles is out of New York, and she's, I saw her play at the Blue Note, and she's up there, uh, she's playing acoustic. Uh, well, I mean, she's um, basically got an acoustic band, keyboard player, which her husband, and but she's got a sampling table too. And so she's taken it. She's sampling some deep, maybe like a Nina Simone and samples it and twists it and tweaks it. And then the band comes in and she starts singing and they take it into some really cool territory that um, that to me pushes it way beyond, you know, the stuff that you're critical of. And Veronica Swift in her own way, too, uh, is in, is going back and incorporating a lot of like rock opera. And Veronica Swift, if you don't know, her parents were jazz musicians. She was playing professionally by the time she was nine years old. All her her track record um, is one of just like immaculate jazz, swinging Sarah Vaughn meets Mel Torme. I mean, she's a jazz badass. Now she's throwing in, you know, like I said, Freddie Mercury, uh, you know, all these different rock opera aspects into that jazz. And she's kind of, um, she's making her own honest statement that's, that swings, that comes from that jazz idiom, but it's not what her, what the old fan, it's not what the old Miles Davis fans would, would call jazz. So a lot of this music today, a lot of these people 
they're running from the jazz label too. They don't want it to be called jazz because it'll turn the people off. It'll turn potential fans off of their music, you know, because people think jazz is 1959 doodly doodly doodly. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, they don't want it called that. But 20 years from now, my guess is that Melanie Charles and Veronica Swift and 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 Quest Love and a lot of these guys are going to be thrown into the jazz bin. You know, they're going to be seen as the pioneers who who take the spirit of it. You know, both the, the the theory, the technique, and the and the spirit and the feeling, and they take it wherever they want to take it. Um, you know, in the, in the same way that Dizzy Gillespie, you know, knew what Louis Armstrong did, and suddenly met these Cuban drummers, and is like. Oh shit! I want that in my band, and I want some of this, and let's try that. And he blew it off. You know, he took it out of the stratosphere. He knocked it out of the park by combining contemporary elements in a way that no one else was combining, and it left the audience and the critics scrambling as to what to call it. He didn't care; they just kept playing it. So, well, uh, here's an interesting thing. Um, a few years ago, when I was working at the college that I work at. Um, I was chatting to all the girl musicians, and the, I'm not the, the, all the female musicians. The, oh yes, the the, the 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 girl students at the college, and they were moaning really? about the boys. You know, they were hogging it all and all that type of stuff. Now, as you know, I'm not much of an identity politics person, and I'm not one that would go let's 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 spot on a gig and it will be just black people. Or I don't believe in that. But chat to these girls. I said, why don't we put on an all female gig? And the boys said, well, what are we going to do? And I said, you're going to support them. You're going to watch it. That's what you're going to do. And um, this is me challenging myself because I don't like this categorization of people by identity. I like to treat people more as individuals. And I think that's a fundamental thing that I think jazz jazz is about individuals. I've argued this on the channel. You know, when, when I was a kid brought up by my parents as I was, I would look at my dad's Duke Ellington albums and I would look at Duke Ellington as being... That's Duke Ellington. My God, look at him. And I'd look at what he looked like and his hands and everything. Not really thinking that he was a black guy. He was Duke Ellington. <laughs> That's Duke Ellington. <laughs> you know, uh, and, and that was a very strong feeling that this went. If you say, oh, you know, Duke Ellington is a great black musician. No, he's not. He's just great. <laughs> Stop. You know, anyway, so to challenge myself. But Andy, Andy, let me yeah. let me jump in there because that's an exact the the movie I'm working on now. Uh, I'm titling it "We Are Here: Women in Jazz." It's it's. Well, this is what I, this exactly is really the... this is where I'm going with. This. So I I said to the girls because from an artistic point of view, do whatever you want. I said, well, just do a, a female only show, and it was entirely different. And the reason it was different is because when we normally do a gig. The boys are competing against each other and they get in their little tribe and then you have a bunch of separate bands on and they're all trying to outdo each other. The girls work together. They put on cakes and put lights up and all the way through it, they were supporting each other in absolutely a completely different way, a different dynamic. And, and jazz has been so male centric this is what I mean about open. Not you need to. You do need to be inclusive, but without labelling people, you need to create a um, uh, a sort of territory where that sort of energy can come in and be celebrated for being different. And and you've said this, you know, like with Native Americans and Creoles and all. This is what jazz always did. It was always opening its arms to everybody and bringing it all in. And I think that's a really interesting thing that the the two artists you think are really doing something different are women you know but how we how do we tra traverse that without not being patronizing to them and go right we're gonna shuffle everybody off here's some great women in jazz and then we go yeah they, she's really good for a woman <laughs> that always worries me you know it's like uh, right yeah. well you, that's right the the there's two interesting points at least in what you just said i want to speak to the the dynamic at your school that experiment um, the, the concert you put on because it raises a couple interesting points and uh, I've interviewed uh, over 40 women for this upcoming film and and they it runs the gauntlet of women who feel that there's definitely something different when you work with just women and other people who say women are just as competitive and maybe even more competitive than men because they have to be they can't be just as good as a man they have to be better 
putting aside the whole dynamic of women competing against each other for attention anyway. Yeah. So there's an argument argument to be had on both sides, but but what what I think the predominant um, observation is is that it comes down to masculine and feminine energy. That's it. Not that's nothing. exactly it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, because and, we know. And and, and we, if you take someone like Miles Davis, who is one of the greatest musicians in history, he's an embodiment of both energies. Extreme, extreme masculinity with extreme femininity. Oh, Sublime yeah, down yeah. the middle. Yeah. He's the boxer, literally. The yeah. guy that, that trained as a boxer and yeah. then could play ballads that will make us all just weep. The most, the most tender, some of the most tender trumpet playing imaginable. Uh, a vulnerable, um, a deep, painful. Um, in, yeah, he was extraordinary. What you said, he was the embodiment of both, and I think that's the challenge. Is is especially society culturally how we learn. I think men have a lot of learning. Uh, the culture has been really unfair to men in 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 teaching us, peer pressuring us to to bottle up that feminine energy, and there's a lot of neurotic. Uh, uh, unhealthy things that happen. Um, we can learn, we men can learn a lot uh, again from women to embrace and internalize that, that feminine side. We learn from other men as well. Perhaps men learn easier from other men because the challenge of becoming a feminine isn't there. But it's super complex and it's best to stay with feminine masculine energies because what happens when you start talking about the transgender people? It, are we, you know, is that a man? Is that a woman? Uh, if you if you say men are all this way, so that takes me back to your school experiment, which is interesting that that happened. And it's it's hats off to you for doing that. It's a great experiment. Well, I have to say a secret. I have to say a secret. The girls yeah. did let let the boys play in it. That was part of it. They were going, come on, you're coming in. It, it was a different thing altogether. You know, it's it's you know, it was definitely that, well, like. Uh, it, uh, I mean, the other thing I, that happens at college is I'll be sat there with a bunch of kids, guitarists, or I play guitar as well, drummers, and the, and they're all going, how do you play fast? So I'm going, you, you need to do this to play fast, but you need to do this. I can't do it, Andy. We need to play fast. How fast are you? I'm really fast. Look how fast, because I'm, you know, and they go, my God, Andy's so fast. How do I get that fast? And then the girls are like, why do you not want to play fast? <laughs> it's like, they, they, there's that, you're totally right. There's also, you know, Boys, males, whatever you want to say, exactly the same. I, I agree with the whole thing. This this energy thing, I think there's a vulnerability to jazz that the great artists had. You know, I think Coltrane's got it. There's something in his sound. There's, I think, I think. Um, well, and this is but, your yeah. this may this may tie back into the whole academic environment, which is really um, artificial. And I think, and, and not in a bad way necessarily. It's it's. I mean, I'm a big, big fan of education, don't get me wrong, but we have to be careful because when you put people in this artificial environment where where you're supposed to prove yourself to get a good grade or where you you maybe even inadvertently pit people in a competitive situation, um, universities don't really um, uh, uh, reward you for being a slow ballad player. Uh, or for being, you know, for uh, for emoting in, in a simple over a three chord structure, right? Yeah, That's, play the blues. It's, yeah, play the I mean, blues. I mean, in your film, they're going, some of the guys say they're taking blues out of the jazz colleges. You take the blues out of jazz, there's no jazz. There's no jazz. <laughs> I mean, it's like, you know, it's. You're right, um, especially if, yeah, especially because the blues. If we can generalize, one one of the great things about the blues, which is the vo which which really comes from the singers, I believe, the vocalizations. Yeah. I think it's the singers, the singers and their storytelling, whether it was joyful or mournful. It's it's the you it's the um, it's the qualities of the voice, the scoops, the bends, yeah. the growls. And that's what the instrumentalists are trying to recreate is, is human storytelling. And the blues, that the way you describe jazz, what it has done to swing, the blues, I think, uh, has really um, allowed that human that human voice to be to be uh, 
to be the master storyteller, um, really. But 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 going but the academy is very dangerous for what it fosters. It it fosters competitiveness. It fosters that fast complexity. I mean, let's face it. School is all about learning to become more complex. For the most part, most most university levels don't teach you how to just draw a straight line. <laughs> yeah. But if you want to make a highway, sometimes the straight line is the best. I don't know. Um, well, I but, did, but, well, one of the biggest lessons I ever learned was back when I was playing with Robert Plant. And uh, Robert um, was trying to get me to do a drum part. I won't tell the story exactly because it's much more complex. But he was trying to get me to play this drum part anyway. And he, he couldn't explain what he wanted. And I started to question him on it. And he says, look... He says, what you're doing is, he's, he's, he says, you're trying to shine because I'm that type of player. I am. I'm fast and all over. And that's, that's my background. I came through all that Billy Cobham thing. He's, and he says, what I want you to do is disappear. I want you to disappear into the music. I want the song to come out. And and he says, when, even when you're just hitting the backbeat, your backbeat is grooving. I don't want it to groove. I just want it to sit and disappear into the music. Uh, and 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 I and I remember thinking, the players that really work are the guys that can do that. They're they they. It's an incredible skill to be able to disappear into the music and not stand out. Um, Andy, I I agree. I I had a very similar uh, learning curve. I guess I, very similar. I th I feel that it almost took me thirty five years. To, to finally embrace that on stage, to be very comfortable with serving the music with at times with nothing or simple or what you said was fascinating, a backbeat that's not grooving, but yeah. there. It made, it made me, it kind of made me think of some of the Pink Floyd songs where some of that drumming is, sim it's, it's perfect. It's powerful, but it's not the, yeah, yeah, exactly. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. It's just dim, dim, ba, dim, 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 ba. I, I think that's a brilliant. And so, my question to you, Andy, is: Do you teach in that moment? I don't know the whole story, but it sounds like Robert Plant was really talking about some greater, big picture music. Do you ever tell your students that too? That lesson, like, oh, I, everything I teach from is I. I'm unschooled, right? I'm a rock guy. I never learned to read music. I never had a drum lesson in my life. And I love jazz because my dad had brought me up on jazz. I would put jazz records on and just make up what I thought was on the records. That's how I learned. I started to read music when I was 22. So all my formative stuff, and, and even now I don't process through it. I can read, but I, 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 my the way I play is in a completely different way. I've always had an empathy for those types of musicians, you know, that that, that sort of rock raw type of musician. Um, I've worked in the industry. I've worked in all sorts of different parts of the industry. Um, I got known as being quite a virtuoso drummer. I, 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 I've been in the deep end doing clinics with Thomas Lang and Marco Miniman and doing all the five time signatures at the same time stuff. I've done all that, you know, and uh, um, and so I've gone through that and I've played with and I try and teach from my experience. Right. And if a if a musician does want to play through giant steps and do all that, I will help them to do that. I really will. I'm not against it. If they want it, then you do it and have a go at it, you know. But if, like, when the kid says, how do you play through giant steps? I'm going to try and give them a way in. I'm going to try and give them a way in that they can go, oh, God, yeah. Rather than go, it's so hard. You have to walk for years. You're probably not worthy enough to do it, you know. I just hate that, you know. It's like, um, Andy, have you got a way of cheating your way through giant steps? Yeah, I have. Yeah, yeah. Try this. Try this, you know. <laughs> Because everything I learned seemed to be like that for me. You know, I, I, I got there by doing it wrong. And I always felt that when musicians do it wrong, they come up with something new, basically. Uh, you, just, you just uttered what could be a great autobiography. I, I got there by doing it wrong. Oh, totally, uh, totally. I ain't got a clue. You know, it's like uh, I can remember I had a Billy Cobham album and there was a track that was in 19, 17, 16. I didn't even know what a time signature was, but I knew that there was something going on. So I got this. My mum and dad had this thing that you would click when you've got an audience walking in. You know, you click, you could count. 
right? And I would, I was putting this record on and then just trying to go and stop. And then I was going, it keeps adding up to 17. What's, what's this 17 mean? Right? That's awesome, man. That's, 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 I'm, I, and the thing is, that's my background. That's probably what informs a lot of my attitude. My thing yeah. was, I was a music fan. Thousands of albums going all over the country, going searching through this and going, I wonder who this guy is. Rassan Roland Kirk, who is he? Oh, I'll buy that. That, you know, taking it home. What's yeah. going on? There's, there's more than one yeah. saxophone player on. I mean, it, it, that's how I learn. And I think that's how everybody learns. You, you have to find your way in. you got to find your way in. Well, certainly. And, and, and the early... You know, if you go back to the uh, late 1800s, of course, there were no records and transportation was limited. So these musicians were walking down a street, taking a bus, whatever. Uh, it wasn't really a bus in 1880, but uh, go going from from town to town and hearing other musicians. And and that's the same thing. They weren't reading music. Um, they were listening and, and absorbing all of these influences. And, and that's how the great started. Yeah. Um, they, so they, it's very much like you. Where, where I live is the centre of sort of the British rock thing. So we've got, um, I know the guys from ELO, I know the guys from Zeppelin, you know, they're, 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 this is the area, right? And I know a lot of those guys that came up at that time in the rock and roll in the 50s, you know, the ones that really created rock music. And I, uh, my mate, Kevin Gammon, who's an absolute legend, um, he said to me, I said, how did you learn the guitar in the 1950s? And he said, well, I'd listen to the radio and if they put a Chuck Berry song on, I would pick up my guitar and try and get the first chord. Then I would wait for it to be on the radio again. And then I would try and get the second chord. And that was how these guys were learning. You know, and if they could get hold of an Elvis Presley record, that was hard. That was a hard thing to oh, do. You know, the, yeah. the Beatles emerged because they were in Liverpool and they had all these sailors coming in, bringing in American R&B records and stuff. It's, and... and um, those guys created something wonderful because they got the blues and everything wrong. They got jazz and blues wrong. That's that's that that invented rock music. And I think this is another thing. That's great. You, you know, <laughs> it's like Tina Turner's died, right? Tina Turner's voice. She's a jazz singer. She's a hundred percent a jazz singer. She's a hundred percent a blues singer, without a doubt, isn't she? She she would not exist without jazz and blues, without a doubt. It's and and that. and yeah. And the church, you know, and the, the church, uh, yeah, and gospel, yeah. yeah, and all that stuff. Right. That's what that's what she comes from. And probably what the problem is is for jazz, in its academic sense, to survive, it has to draw the draw bridges up. It has to go. No, th now this is jazz. I think, and I think that's what happened in the nineteen eighties with Winter, Winter Masalis. Wait, now hang on, everybody. You know, I'm not against this pop music. I'm not against this disco. I'm don't. I'm not against Michael Jackson, but this isn't really jazz. Look, let's. You know, when Herbie Hancock does "Rock It," that's not jazz. I respect Herbie, <laughs> but let's put the. And, let's... I, and I guess one of the questions is, is like, so what? I mean, why does why does it have to be labeled? Why why do, why are we concerned of whether it's jazz? There's or not? the problem. There's the and, problem. And because this music, uh, Tina Turner and. And the Duke Ellington you reference, and all these guys made great feeling music that 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 made people just react. You either danced, you laughed, you cried, you got up and moved. I mean, it, it just made you feel good, and you didn't care. And while you're listening to the music, you're not saying, "Wow, this is great jazz," or "Wow, this is great rock." You're just like, "Yeah." And you I, know. Uh, so this is, I mean, we've so these, we've spoken for over an hour, and we're coming into our last ten minutes now. And I feel that um, we've arrived at somewhere because, as you said that, what popped into my head, I've read so many interviews with the, you know, the greats that I'm pointing to and go, where are these? You know, the Miles Davises, Sonny Rollins, all those guys. They hated the word jazz, didn't they? Many people did. Yeah. Well, uh, yes, many people did. Uh, yeah. Many people still do. Um, uh, some people, yeah, some people saw it as a... Uh, as a disrespectful term, other people just saw, like I said earlier, some people saw it as a box. They didn't want their music calls that because they knew it would turn off other people who just hated that word. Yeah. Uh, but don't you but, think that, that for me, the groundbreaking musicians at the moment, the ones I do listen to would be like Louis Cole, Noah. I, I like Snarky Puppy. It's very derivative of fusion about 40 years. Yeah. It's like it's like the Brecker brothers with, with the, you know, with cool people. Uh, it's, 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 but, but the thing is, is those, 
groups that are able to emerge on YouTube, they often will they they shy away from being labeled as jazz. And maybe that's the thing that jazz really needs to do is go like, if we really need to survive, we've just got to stop talking about jazz and trying to label this as jazz and let that go by the wayside and let those musicians just take the influences in. Because the truth is I'm influenced by jazz musicians, rock drummers. I, I used to make dance music, house music, house music's jazz. How, how House music, the heavy house music is jazz. We were putting records out that were just a house beat. And then a jazz pianist just playing over, you know, yeah, but you know, that's what we were putting out and people put that. I mean, you, you can put it, you can spin it the other way. You know, jazz really is everything because yeah. it will eventually absorb it. Yeah. I mean, to me, to, to me, jazz is a buffet table that just keeps growing. You can bring, you can bring anything to a jazz song and make it work. Yeah. A anything. And so, so yeah, <laughs> you so know. May, maybe the answer to this is, is to just stop talking about jazz. Just stop it. <laughs> I need to pack my YouTube down. <laughs> I, I love talking about them. But I love talking about them. Just, I just feel all I'm arguing for is to open the doors up. That's all I'm arguing. Just open the doors up and, and just <laughs> let it be, let it be. Because I think most true jazz musicians, all these young jazz musicians that are coming out, I'm not and that's why I've never mentioned one. I've never said that young guy sounds like I will never do that. I'm never going to have a go like that. Um, I know because I, I, okay, I, I, I'll do it to people okay in the too. past, but I, I wouldn't want to try and put that on new because I teach kids. I know I know what they're trying to do. I know, you know, they they love the music and they do want to do something different, you know. Well, well, here's here's something about about the youth. And, and, and as youth, just like you said, with your career, you started by emulating Billy Cobham and the records yeah. you heard it. And it's it's normal for youth to start by emulating. And we have to remember that even college age kids, they're still pretty young, they're emulating. So why not emulate the masters? The, the trick is the true masters would encourage you, you know, life on the road with these big bands, you learn to find your own voice. You know, when you're 14, 15, yeah, you've got to copy someone, uh, and, but that's a route to discovering your own voice, your own sound. And so there's really nothing wrong with sounding like Miles or Sonny Rollins or anyone from the past until you get to be, you know, by the time you're a young adult, depending when you started, if you pick it up as a 22 year old, yeah, you might have to spend five years copying someone, but that should just be a springboard. The problem is the academy locks you into that. They don't teach you. They don't encourage you to believe that this is just a springboard to finding your own voice. Voice, yeah. They they indoctrinate you and they indoctrinate indoctrinate and, you to a, a scene that no longer exists so these right. guys that left where, where did they go then to then start that, doing the work that's right and there are people coming out of the out of the academia system uh out of the academic system that are breaking boundaries they there are yeah, people that make it out of there but in general that's one of the big problems is the academy isn't teaching you that this is just a means to finding your own voice and 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 that's why they get so stuck on this is what jazz is. Well, I, I can remember chatting to an older jazz musician once and I was asking him about certain scales and things like that. And I said, uh, you know, I was asking him technical questions and he just turned around and said, you've got to remember that those guys in the old days, they were playing like three shows a day. And if they got some scale, they would just try it out all night, all night, all night on the bandstand. People would shout what you're doing. And then, they, you know, and that, that's what it was. It, 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 that's how the music was created. You know, people be trying it out. Where do these guys that's been indoctrinated through this academic um, approach to teaching jazz? Where do they go now? Right? Where do they go? And what they do is they become YouTubers. <laughs> that's what they do. <laughs> and, and, and that's interesting because you don't get you don't get the immediate audience feedback no. that you just spoke of. That's well, that's I think it's, it's a, if, if and this is the point I've made. If you're on YouTube or Instagram. The only way to grab someone is by playing flashy stuff and playing what people know, because that's how our algorithm works. If you like jazz and you said you like jazz and they're going to push jazz at you and anything that's rocking that boat is not going to work. You know, um, we've got we're back to our last two minutes, Ben. So um, I really enjoyed this. This has been a cracking conversation. So uh, um, I'm cracking. so pleased. Of, yeah, <laughs> well, I think I think um, we're going to have to do another one at some point. I'd love to, Andy. This yeah. is, I love 
obviously I love talking about about jazz, <laughs> about yeah. all kinds of music. Well, despite, kind of despite what everyone thinks about me hating modern jazz, because of the channel, I'm attracting a number of modern jazz musicians and I've supported them and tried to push their music. And it would be lovely to pull some of those guys in and get a bit of a jazz chat going on, you know, from people. My friend BD Lenz, fantastic jazz fusion guitarist working in New York. It'd be lovely to bring him in because I'm very aware that he has to work within the genre he's in. He can't, he can't. You know, I understand well, that. A big you know. part of that is the is the record label uh, pressure. Some of these people who already have uh, record label deals, um, you know, just can't step out and do whatever they want, or they do at risk of losing the support of their label. Yeah, yeah, it's so it's complex. So, so. It's a complex thing, <laughs> but it's lovely to talk about it. I'm gonna. We got we got one minute thirty five seconds, so I'm gonna okay, wind this down. Jazz and jazz town. Yeah, I'm I gonna, I, I'll put all that. I'm going to do it. We'll, we'll sort all that out. Now, all the links are down. Check this. Check Ben out. He knows his stuff. He knows his stuff. And I don't, I say that very rarely. He's he, he's told me things today. Yeah. I've learned stuff. He knows this guy's yeah. the guy. Check his Thank film you, out. It's brilliant. There's very few jazz films that are actually any good. This is the real deal. Ben, you're the real deal. Love you very much. Great talking to you. Hopefully, we're going to stay friends forever and ever. <laughs> I, I know we are, Andy. I know we are. <laughs> I love you, mate. Thank you for this Thank opportunity. You. Yeah, keep, keep in touch. We'll do another one another time on another subject. Filmmaking. I love filmmaking. Let's chat filmmaking oh. next time. Oh, jazz, let's, oh, let's jazz, do it. Jazz films. Jazz films. We can get into... Uh, oh. I've just oh. done a video on Whiplash. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a, there's a trigger, uh, yeah. button-pushing trigger. That's how to play fast. <laughs> <laughs> See you, Ben. <laughs> Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you, Andy. All right. Till the next time.